Awesome. Well, like Ali said, my name is Nicole. I work at the California Lighting Technology Center, and I recognize most of your names. So good to be with you again through this virtual platform. I am presenting on the Million LED Challenge Phase 2, uh, which is a, a program that CLTC um, helped evolve uh, to provide high quality LED lights uh, with an informed product selection, great price, and ease of purchase priority. So what exactly is the program? Well, uh, through our contacts at the University of California Office of the President, we were able to collaborate with most of the California public building entities, including the community college system, um, the CSUs, the Department of General Services, so all the state buildings. Um, and then the program is also available to any other organization that's interested. Um, so for example, uh, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, uh, which is one of our affiliates, has uh, joined as well to take advantage of this um, statewide effort to procure high quality energy efficient light sources. Um, if you're thinking to yourself, this sounds really familiar, um, that's because you may have heard me speak on this a few years ago. Um, phase one was launched in 2018 and I did a similar energy bite on um, phase one, which was focused on different light source types. So that was all about screw base lamps and down lights, mostly a residential emphasis. Um, phase two um, took a little longer to get off the ground, um, mostly because of the, the research and the background that I'm gonna dive into today. Took, took a while to get audits completed and, and things like that, let alone all the contracting mechanisms that UCOP put in place. Um, but with that being said, it was a non-residential building emphasis. So we focused on uh, linear LED lamps, also known as T-LEDs, tubular lamps, um, retrofit kits, and new luminaires. Uh, and a lot of this stemmed from these key questions that are up on the screen. You know, why, why do we need this program? Well, there was pretty big research questions on all of these topics, you know, electrical architecture, light output, system efficacy, dimmability and, and control um, performance aspects like flicker, and then light source quality um, with respect to distribution and, and color. Um, and then some more pragmatic issues when you're getting into retrofits like will this actually fit in the hole that I, I need to put it in? So some drivers um, are different form factors. So that, that becomes an issue as well. Um, so with funding provided by the California Energy Commission's EPIC program, we were able to, to work on this list of questions and come up with the answers um, based on what we found um, in the lab, as well as you know, some survey work and some auditing that we did in collaboration with uh, the UC system specifically. Um, and the audit was really meant to help us um, select the form factors that, that we wanted to include in phase two. So I already kind of listed off the, the types of products, but within each of those types, there's different um, lamp configurations, size configurations, um, and so by focusing on, um, on the items that, um, outlined in yellow, we were able to be sure that we were addressing the majority of the existing uh, lighting stock that's installed today. So what exactly do, the, do, do these look like? Uh, I put a, a little uh, key up on the screen to help us keep these in mind. The T-LEDs or the linears are on the left, which are a great option for more um, architectural type fixtures. So if you've got um, an 
indirect pendant that you know it, it fits the space. You're not looking to change that. You just need a more efficient light source. Something um, like an, a linear LED is a really good option. So we wanted to be sure to include those products. Um, and they're also the, the newest um, technology of the three. Uh, and there were more questions about linear LEDs than trough of retrofit kits or new luminaires. Uh, and so I, I mentioned we put together a specification. This is it. I'm not going to read this slide to you, don't worry, but uh, we are going to walk through some of the key bullets and kind of dive into the research that went into um, its inclusion on this slide. Um, so, but you can see here that we split it into two categories, mostly because of the similarity between retrofit kits and new fixtures. Those are one category. And then the linear LED lamps or T-LEDs um, get their own category. So the first bullet on the specification was the electrical architecture. So a little bit of background on what that means um, with respect to linear LED lamps. There are four key types today that UL has published definitions for. Um, the diagrams on the right are for type A, B, and C uh, as you go down the page. And we're really looking at um, wiring configurations plus device location. So type A at the top um, is really keeping with the same uh, architecture that you would find in a fluorescent system. And uh, you're even able to keep the ballast. So you're literally just taking the fluorescent lamp out and putting the uh, LED lamp in. And uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that, mostly because there's always going to be a list of approved ballasts from the manufacturer that you need to make sure you're pairing it with. Otherwise, um, there's a whole slew of performance issues that might occur. Uh, and so that brings us to type B. And, the, and those products were really developed out of those performance concerns from type A. Why don't we just get rid of the ballast? And so um, in this configuration, the lamp is wired directly to the line voltage, um, which simplifies it um, in theory. But there are a couple of issues that came out of those products being used over the last few years that uh, we wanted to address. Um, the first one being thermal considerations. Um, so the, the life of the LEDs um, are compromised when you Put the all of the electrical components inside the tube. Um, so the temperature of the whole tube ends up uh, rising and then uh, you've, you've got a, um, a hotter system which degrades the, the LED and you lose out on some of your hours of life that way. Um, the other major issue was safety um, and UL has done a lot of work, ETL has done a lot of work to come up with markings, field markings to help alleviate the safety concerns. Um, but when you do a retrofit like this, where you're changing a traditionally low voltage um, point to a high voltage point, there's always going to be safety concerns um, with maintenance and um, having a different protocol for those two types of, of services being um, addressed. Um, which brings us to type C, which uh, the, the heading on this slide is why type C, um, and that's because this is the type that the MLC program has specified um, as best in class. And this is uh, for all of the reasons I just dove into, the, the driver is outside of the lamp system, and it is a dedicated driver that you buy with the, the LED tube. So all of the performance issues are, are known um, through the third party testing that's required for all of the, the products that are commercially available today. So uh, there's a, a lot more um, confidence in type C products. And the fourth type is a hybrid. So you can combine um, two of the types into one product. And, and these um, 
are desirable for some retrofit situations. If you wanted to start with a hybrid type AC, for instance, because you had budget to swap out your lamps um, today, but you didn't have budget to swap out your driver. And then as the existing ballast failed, you could swap that out um, to the dedicated driver. So that um, hybrids are also a, a good solution. There's just far fewer of them on the market. So that is why we went with type C. Um, there's also some considerations um, that we'll get into on the next slide about the efficiency gains, um, but I wanted to save uh, that for the next slide. Light, the light output and distribution was selected based on some market assessment work that we did. Um, and really uh, the takeaway on this slide is we wanted one SKU to rule them all. Uh, we don't want you to have to have, you know, five or 10 different products on your shelf uh, to go and do maintenance. We just wanted you to be able to grab a tube and a driver and go uh, perform lighting maintenance just like you would on a traditional fluorescent system. So if you're thinking back to the audit, you know we've got choppers, strips, pendants, wraps, all of these different form factors. And we're looking to find one beam angle and one light output that would deliver the same amount of lighting service as your fluorescent system. Um, and so that's how those numbers were um, reduced from our, our lab analysis. Uh, this is diving into that efficacy uh, question. This is really focused on type C. So the items in yellow on, on the right are um, type C products that meet the 120 lumen per watt minimum. And um, so, you know, it's definitely feasible. We did this market assessment a few years ago and there were five products at that time. Um, we've got well over five products in the MLC program now that have been created since this market assessment. So I'm really hoping to um, use the program as a way to introduce new um, high quality products into the California market, um, as well as help specifiers get them into their buildings. Um, the controllability bullets that uh, we included in our specification on the previous slide really dive into um, three main things, dimmability, controllability, and flicker. Dimming is required by um, the building energy efficiency standards or Title 24. Um, so that's important to include. Uh, if your project triggers code, you're going to want to include that. Uh, and I can't see the chat screen, Ali. So if there's a question for me, please feel free to interrupt. Um, The controllability, we really just wanted to make sure that the products in the MLC program were control ready and that they would be able to be um, used in either simplistic lighting controls to meet energy code or um, in more robust building management systems, which really ties in well to the presentation that Tristan will be giving um, after this one. Uh, and so the more controllable dimmable um, light sources that we have installed statewide, the more deeper savings we can achieve by you know, including them in these more robust control um, schemes that, that Tristan will be diving into. Um, and finally, you know, there's some flicker um, concerns. As you do dim, um, you wanna make sure that the product you're installing is uh, able to perform well throughout that whole dimming range. So we worked hard to make sure that the, the products in this program do just that. Another issue that we've been working on hard for uh, California's light sources is color quality. And you can see in this photo, two um, hands, they both belong to our director, Michael Semenovich, um, underneath an 80, RF light source and a 90 RF. Now color is definitely a subjective um, topic, uh, but in general, the, 
major takeaway from a picture like this is, is that the one on the left is more natural looking. Um, and, and that's really what we're going for. We wanna make sure that the um, experience in our buildings is as close to the experience you get under natural uh, daylight outside of our buildings um, for quality of life. So uh, we bumped that up to 90. A lot of the industry is following suit. I think when we started this initiative, you know, maybe six or seven years ago, uh, it was more polarizing, but most of the standards are now um, citing this higher color quality now. And finally, the last bullet, all else meet the um, DLC standard minimum criteria. You know, uh, some of the things we're asking for were difficult at the beginning. Um, it did take us almost a year to get the contracts in place. And so in that time, technology evolved, prices came down and things got easier <laughs> um, to sell. And um, so that was really great. Uh, but for these five bullets that are on the screen, we didn't think we needed to ask for anything more than what industry was already doing. So aligning with a, a standard um, so that they didn't have to go do any additional work was really important to us and our partners. Um, so for CCT or the color appearance, um, the projected life, which is in, can range anywhere from um, 50,000 to 100,000 hours for a typical LED uh, luminaire today. Um, I, DLC is requiring 50,000 minimum, but some of the products in MLC have um, exceeded that for sure. Um, Five-year warranty, power factor of 0.9 with you know, a, a THD limitation on that um, to align with DLC. And then of course, the, the standard safety certifications that are required um, you know, statewide, federally, um, and um, throughout the electrical code. So all of those things are, are being met. And um, in order to approve products, oops, jumping ahead, in order to approve products, um, we did go through third party testing to ensure that all of these um, specification bullets were met. And um, we were able to contract with three different partners to keep the pricing um, really competitive um, and Uh oh, Nicole, we lost your audio there for a second. And those three partners are allowed to add. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. We just you just cut out for just a second. Remind me where I was. <laughs> Back up about maybe maybe a sentence. Oh, okay. It was like literally five five or ten seconds. I was just talking about the approval process and what we did to go through the third party testing, um, as well as you know verify that the products are DLC qualified, um, and the fact that um, the three vendors that we're working with are able to continue adding products to the program over their five year contract. So as technology continues to improve, um, we'll be able to keep that keep up with it and do a little bit better on the pricing um, through the contracting mechanisms. Um, so speaking of pricing, I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide because it's a little overwhelming. But the takeaway is that we did some cost analysis <laughs> and we compared it to a, a number of other um, options, looking at type A, type B, looking at um, ADCRI, those are the big questions that we get asked. Why um, would we go with a more expensive option if uh, you know, we can get the same cost savings? And so we really wanted to dive into this with the pricing from the program being in the far right two columns and compare it to a fluorescent system on the left and compare it to some other LED options in the middle. 
Um, and the takeaway looking at this uh, was that there is a 14% cost savings um, associated with a 41% energy savings for the um, most efficient option that's available in the program today. So I, if you remember, I said our efficacy requirement was a minimum of 120. Some of the um, products are already reaching 150 plus. Um, so that's why we're able to get such deep energy savings, um, which is really exciting. And I, you know, because we are able to add new products over time, I anticipate that continuing to trend in the same way. So I mentioned we have three vendors that, um, that were awarded through the UCOP contracting mechanisms. So these are the three, we've got two distributors, Rexel and Allface, and we have one um, manufacturer selling directly, LED Greenlight. Um, and at this point, um, Rexel and Allface are only providing LED um, lamps, um, but there are um, always going to be products in the queue getting that review done that I, I mentioned. And so um, the website where we host our approved product list um, will be updated to reflect when we add more. Um, and I'm hopeful that we'll get more retrofit kits and luminaires included soon. Um, but if you're interested in learning more or uh, making a purchase, I've provided the contact information on the right. Um, so with that, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, Allie, but I am ready for questions if there's questions. Yeah, great. You know, you're doing great with time. Uh, so there was a couple questions from, I think it's Nishant. If you wanted to, if you're able to unmute yourself, you're welcome to ask the questions directly. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to read um, read the questions too. So I'll wait a second and see if you can unmute. Uh, thanks, Alicia. Uh, this is yeah, Nish yeah. Uh, well, th this is just my second time on these meetups, so so thanks for organizing, and thanks Nicole for you know connecting with me back in 2017 and giving that connection of uh, uh, Corey Jackson, I believe, uh, who kind of led with the DGS, CLTC, and ESCO partnerships. So just to maybe introduce myself, like uh, I work with Anesco and uh, uh, like I had a comment on type C linear lighting. So one added benefit that we also found was uh, with these lights is, um, so type C lights have the driver separate and the lamp separate and the lamps kind of have a life which is greater than 50,000, like approaching 100,000. These drivers are the things which fail. And it has helped our clients, you know, uh, purchase minimal component and thus, uh, you know, save money in the process. So that has been helpful. So that guidance from CLTC is like really valuable to us, uh, our, our organization. So that was one. Um, the second question, which maybe like I had was regarding uh, harmonic distortion. So, does CLTC kind of define a harmonic distortion? Um, like the, the, the reason I ask is like, there are more and more power electronics coming on the grid. There is, you know, electric vehicles which are going to come on. Um, like we have more and more uh, equipment, you know, like starting from our televisions and whatnot, which is basically DC powered, which requires, you know, thyristors in, in the circuit, which basically means, you know, adding more harmonics. So what was a challenge like uh, power factor was a challenge back in the day. Are we going to see harmonics as a challenge of the future? Um, and if, if we have to prevent that, maybe like standards defined with harmonics might be really useful. That's, that, that, that's what I see. So what are your thoughts on that? And does CLTC have a percentage defined for total harmonic distortion. Thank you. Well, thanks for, for being here. Um, and I'm really happy to hear that um, you're having success with the type C uh, approach. We think it makes a lot of sense. And um, 
you know, the more we, we hear back from the field that they agree, the, <laughs> the better, um, which that is a really good point. Um, we are hoping to find partners and, um, and funding, <laughs> uh, which is not relevant to this conversation, but to continue um, and develop case studies for those um, field installations. So that is something that if anyone online is interested in doing an installation and having their building used as a case study, um, and similar to the, the feedback that we just got, uh, I think that would go a long way to um, publish a couple of case studies of how they perform in the buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to your second question, um, yes, we've been looking at THD uh, in our lab studies, and that was part of the, the power quality um, bullet on my, my um, slide for DLC. And I believe um, the, the standard is no more than 20% right now. Um, but you're absolutely, um, your concerns are well placed. And I, um, you know, when we get into the next energy bite, um, that maybe Tristan will be able to to talk to some of the testing that he has done um, hands on with some of the products as they get incorporated into these more robust building management systems. Because I think that's that scenario is when it's it's going to become really apparent that we need to get that addressed. Uh, as an industry, um, but as as far as the MLC specification is concerned, we're aligned with the DLC um, requirement for THD. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, I remember also like one more thing, which maybe I'll add for the group. Um, back in the day, we used to have uh, another uh, standard, which was QPL. So QPL was gone with the pg &E bankruptcy. And we also used to have, uh, or maybe still have, uh, uh, Energy Star, the standard. And uh, I think that definition, which was provided that DLC is the de facto standard, again, is uh, basically helpful for the industry. So thanks again for that. Of course. Yeah, I'm, right. With the, the PG&E's QPL um, kind of getting rolled into DLC, as a way to address their ongoing programs, um, it made a lot of sense to us to select DLC moving forward. Yep. Same here. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Um, Nicole, we had one quick question. Just uh, someone wondering kind of what harmonic distortion is. If you could explain that to them. Sure, sure. So the... Um, Electrical components that you're, we were talking about with the driver, um, you know, inside the driver, there's all of the other standard um, components, capacitors, resistors. Um, and when you start to uh, put those all together, you know, each of those has its own signature. Um, and uh, a well designed driver will have um, less distortion. Um, and a lot of what we see is um, designs for full output, but what happens when you start to dim? Um, it, that becomes an issue and it kind of, um, res I mean, you can liken it to flicker if you want. Not all THD will result in visible flicker, um, but they're loosely connected. Um, but you have, uh, this distortion that's in your your grid um, that uh, will result in uh, dirty power, I guess, if you've heard of that term, you can think of it that way. Great, thank you. Any other quick questions? We're gonna, we'll move on to Tristan and um, maybe some additional time for more questions for Nicole at the end if you stick around here. So Tristan, if you want to share your screen, we'll get started. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. And then uh, is the presentation showing up as expected? It is. Yep. Wonderful. All right. So hi, everyone. My name is Tristan Bond, and I'm a research and development engineer at the California Lighting Technology Center at UC Davis. Today, I'll be talking about one of our recent projects that looked at developing an integrated building control system. To start off, the idea behind an integrated building control system is to take multiple building systems, such as lighting and HVAC, and tie them together with a central programmable controller. In this configuration, uh, each building system is aware of the operations and data provided by every other building system. Uh, historically, these systems have been separate, but uh, when you tie them together, it's possible to achieve additional energy savings and improve occupant comfort. Integrated building control systems are an exciting step in advancing building automation by using data-driven solutions to improve building-wide efficiency. Uh, here on the diagram, you can see it's pretty busy, but uh, it shows the architecture of a building system. And I, I think what I just want you to take away from this is that you have a system integrator at the, in the middle, and each of the various colors represents all the different uh, systems of a building, such as lighting, HVAC, uh, dynamic fenestration, including natural ventilation and dynamic shading. And all of them are interconnected through this uh, central device. I see that there's something in the chat. Let me, uh, I can't bring it up. So if that's uh, something that someone has a question, definitely let me know and I can stop to ask it or answer it. To go over a quick overview of this project, uh, our goal is to develop, deploy, and evaluate an integrated building control system using only commercially available products and technologies. The project was broken into multiple stages, which started first with a market assessment, which led into lab development, and concluded with a full-scale installation of an integrated building control system in one of the buildings here at UC Davis. While we were able to complete the installation of the system, unfortunately, COVID-19 related changes in occupancy patterns means that analysis related to real world performance is delayed for the time being. Given that, today I'll be focusing on lab development section, uh, the lab development section of this project, uh, but hopefully I'll be able to give a similar presentation in the future with uh, actual performance data. So to go over a, an overview of the lab development stage, uh, we tested multiple building systems, multiple technologies, and multiple commercially available products for each component. We want to first verify that when it came to integration, there were several viable options. And this was entirely true. With gateways, bridges, open source communication protocols, we found that there was basically an option readily available for whatever was necessary for a building. There's the option to include just about any sensor or controller needed for almost every application. Some options come in prepackaged systems, like maybe think of an advanced lighting control system, and others come as standalone product offerings. Beyond this, uh, the central controller that ties these systems together is programmable. And so after picking whichever sensor or controller is best suited for your application, you then have the freedom to also uh, program the system to respond in whichever method you think is best for your application. The importance of this is that an integrated building control system does not have a singular configuration. Um, it, it shouldn't be thought of as a basic preset system with limited applications. Instead, it is an idea. It is an entirely customizable system that can be made to work with just about any application out there. If a building manager wants their building automation to modify uh, energy usage with forecasted weather data and log that energy usage of the building to see how effective it was, that can be done pretty easily. And the flexibility goes beyond that. Uh, as new devices or control methods become accessible, the entire integrated building control system can evolve. So you're never really tied into any one configuration of it. You always have the flexibility to change and uh, adapt. And change is exactly what happened throughout the course of our project. Here you can see a picture of our lab space. Uh, as I'm told, these energy bytes usually uh, at some point would have a tour of the CLTC facility. And we always have a fun time showing people the sky wall there on the left side. It's, it's very bright. Um, but uh, to, discuss, <clears throat> uh, to discuss the lab, you can see that uh, it has all the building systems that we talked about. Um, but this is just one picture of it. It's changed 
and evolved uh, over time as we tested additional products and technologies. Uh, in our project, we focused on building systems that included lighting, HVAC, and dynamic fenestration, which includes natural ventilation and dynamic shading. You can see uh, that to test these systems, we have a dedicated HVAC unit, but we're also connected to the building central HVAC, which means that we can have repeatable tests associated with temperature control. Uh, in addition, we have the electric lights and, like I mentioned, that uh, wall of lights on the side. Uh, the wall of lights, called the sky wall, can be used as a daylight simulator. Uh, each of the lamps are dimmable and individually addressable. So that means that we can recreate various daylighting conditions as needed. Um, it was uh, always kind of interesting to simulate sunrise to sunset multiple times in a singular day. Uh, not only was the lab space useful for verifying that many products and technologies tested were suited for integration, uh, it also allowed us to refine the control algorithms that we also developed. So these control algorithms are uh, hosted in the system integrator, which, uh, as I mentioned, is a programmable controller that ties everything together. This device has multiple names, such as system integrator, building automation system, building energy management system, and so on. Uh, you can see here an example, uh, which is the JACE 8000 by Tritium, uh, also known as Vicon. Um, the role of this device is to facilitate communication between all of the integrated building systems. To do this, it needs to be able to communicate over multiple protocols, with some common ones being uh, BACnet, RS-485, and internet protocols such as HTTP or HTTPS. Additionally, the system integrator needs to be programmable so that the building automation can be personalized to the specific needs of the application and also involve, evolve as applications change. The control algorithm that we developed, uh, we break it into multiple smaller algorithms, which I'll get, in, get into shortly. Um, it was extremely useful to have the system integrator provide the framework to segment code uh, instead of having to keep track of the entire algorithm in one file. Uh, additionally, the programming interface was graphical, and so it made programming building level logic feel a lot more natural and helped visualize what the program was actually doing. Uh, this is to say that the task of programming and commissioning an entire building is much more accessible than I had ever anticipated, uh, which I feel is important to mention that because the barrier for implementing an integrated building wide control system is much simpler than it might seem. Um, you know, when it comes down to it, you have several commercially available products that are primed for integration. You have a system integrator that has processes that makes commissioning simpler, uh, such as automatic commissioning methods. And the programming is oftentimes uh, able to be described with relatively simple if-else statements. So given all of this, and given that uh, there's significant improvement in energy efficiency and occupant comfort available, I really hope to see integrated building systems become more common as we move forward. So I wanted to talk about the uh, algorithms that we developed, starting with the HVAC algorithm. Um, so to discuss the connections, when controlling an HVAC system, it is possible to have the system integrator directly manage HVAC calls for heating and cooling. You could essentially design it to replace the thermostat if you really wanted. However, it's much more simple, and what we ended up doing was just communicating with a smart thermostat. Here you can see a process flow diagram of the HVAC algorithm. The main idea of this algorithm is to reduce energy use by ensuring that the HVAC is off while space is unoccupied. The occupancy data that drives this strategy is provided by occupancy sensors from the lighting system. Remember that when it comes to integration, every sensor shares this data with the entire system which means that the HVAC doesn't need to have any native occupancy sensors for this algorithm to work. This saves on installation costs and uh, unlocks additional energy saving strategies just by allowing these systems to talk. The occupancy based strategy, um, the reason why I, I think it's so useful is that it eliminates the need for managing scheduling. Scheduling is a great approach for ensuring that the HVAC doesn't run at night but it can't capture the inherent variability of occupancy patterns. So if people leave earlier than the schedule assumes, then you're wasting energy by running the HVAC when no one's in the office. But if they happen to leave later, then they may end up working in an uncomfortable environment, which decreases occupant comfort. 
Uh, furthermore, if you have holidays, those need to be pre-programmed. And if the entire office is working off-site for a day, then you have another situation where HVAC uh, energy can be wasted. So by using occupancy-based controls, uh, which respond to the conditions of the space rather than assumptions about the space, uh, we can try to provide a more accurate understanding of when the HV HVAC should be turned off. That style of occupancy-based HVAC controls has been shown to save energy in multiple studies, uh, but there's it can be taken even further. Um, so as I mentioned, as systems evolve and new technologies become available, uh, the system can be redesigned to facilitate uh, those strategies. So for example, if you use analytics on occupancy data to find occupancy patterns, you can utilize predictive occupancy-based controls instead of waiting for occupancy sensors to time out, say 20 minutes after the last person leaves the office. When you can use historical data to predict when people leave, you can uh, end up turning the HVAC off sooner, which saves more energy and doesn't require any additional hardware. Additionally, since you still have the occupancy sensors in the office, if for some reason the predictions come in contention, you can um, quickly correct that false, uh, false I think it would be false negative uh, fairly easily. Another strategy that uh, would have been really interesting to implement, but uh, we didn't have the devices required because it does require a variable air volume HVAC system or maybe an air HVAC system with dampers, um, would be to uh, modulate the airflow throughout the entire building. So the idea is that lighting systems have several occupancy sensors, basically one in every single room. And so they can provide a more granular view of occupancy and inform the HVAC system as to which rooms actually need cooling or how much cooling is required. So the idea here, if someone calls out sick, then it's possible to reduce the cooling in the vacant room, which can save energy by reducing the total HVAC load. On the other side, if you have a conference room with multiple people, then occupancy comfort can be improved by ensuring that enough air is flowing into that room. So certainly a lot of interesting options to save energy and improve occupant comfort just within the HVAC system. And again, the great thing here is that the integrated system can evolve as new strategies become available. So you know, you're not locked into whatever you happen to have available at the date of installation. Moving on to the next algorithm, uh, which is closely related to HVAC, we have natural ventilation. So natural ventilation in this case is referring specifically to actuated ventilable windows. Uh, in the picture in the middle, you can see uh, some of the windows from the installation site. And I gotta say, watching all of them open and close together is uh, pretty cool, at least for the first time. Um, the goal of this algorithm is to offset the HVAC load by utilizing the outside air temperature. This means the algorithm is pulling in data from multiple systems, not just one. So you have internal temperature data from the thermostat, external temperature and weather conditions from a weather station, the run mode of the HVAC, and occupancy data. The algorithm compares the internal and external air temperatures to determine if opening the window would aid the HVAC system. This means that if it's, say, cooler outside than it is inside and the HVAC is trying to cool the space, then the windows can open up to help uh, help the cooling process along. This means the HVAC doesn't need to run as long, which saves on energy use. A specific implementation of this algorithm that I really uh, wanted to look into because I find myself doing it just in my home is a pre-cooling strategy. The idea here is that you can utilize the thermal mass of a building uh, by cooling the building at night with fresh air. The goal here is to uh, stave off the need for cooling during the daytime where energy is more, uh, more expensive. Uh, and since you're delaying that uh, need for air conditioning, then you could also reduce the total amount of air conditioning required and save energy that way. Uh, this strategy is not you know, too far-fetched. It's already used in load shifting models. Uh, but in these models, the HVAC is what actually cools the building at night, and it does it does the, uh, does this because energy is uh, generally cheaper at night, um, with the hopes of not running the uh, not running the HVAC system as much during the day when it's a little bit more expensive. Uh, this approach doesn't necessarily reduce energy use, but it could reduce energy costs by shifting the load to cheaper times. Uh, but the benefit of natural ventilation is that there's no fans or chillers needed. 
the cooling happens naturally. And so this approach achieves the same benefits without, uh, while using less energy. So it can end up saving a lot more energy that way. In addition to energy savings, there's the occupant comfort side of uh, this algorithm. So in our research, we found that it was important to keep CO2 levels in a space below a threshold. Uh, higher CO2 levels are associated with drowsiness and headaches, which can be a judgment to worker efficiency and occupant comfort. While the uh, specific threshold varied from source to source, we settled on the well building standard of 800 ppm. Uh, we installed indoor and outdoor CO2 sensors to facilitate an algorithm that would keep the CO2 levels in check. And in addition to this, we also installed particulate sensors to monitor the air quality of the space. The idea is that if the internal CO2 levels are too high or internal air quality is bad, then the algorithm can utilize natural ventilation or even the HVAC system to increase the fresh air changeover and improve the overall air quality. By ensuring that the internal air quality is in check, we can improve occupant comfort, which can also improve uh, worker efficiency. It's important to note that it's not just enough to consider internal air conditions, though. Uh, external conditions should definitely be monitored as well. Uh, for example, if the pollen count is high outside, then you wouldn't want to open up the windows so, it's, so as to not provide discomfort for those people with allergies. And a more poignant example that's applicable to everybody, especially here in California, is wildfires. With the multiple instances of wildfires that have left air quality unhealthy for all individuals in recent years, it's, it's evident that it's important for any and every natural ventilation algorithm to be able to respond appropriately to these disasters to maintain the health of occupants. The other half of the dynamic fenestration algorithm is dynamic shading. Uh, in the lab phase, we looked at shading with motorized Venetian blinds, Halcyon roller shades, and even electrochromic glazing as well. Uh, these shading systems have the ability to selectively accept or reject solar heat gain, which can be used to reduce the uh, load of the HVAC, which reduce the load, you reduce the total energy usage. Uh, this algorithm looks at whether the HVAC is in a heating or cooling mode, and then adjusts the shade to either let solar radiation in or keep it out respectively. Uh, additionally, the algorithm co uh, considers occupancy when making decisions. This is because while maybe you'd want to reject uh, solar radiation at all times to save energy on your HVAC bill, uh, this can have some negative effects while the space is occupied. First, it decreases the amount of daylight in the space, which means that the lighting system has to spend more energy on lighting the space. This is a unique example where you have two building systems that have conflicting strategies to save energy. The lighting system, again, wants to accept as much daylight as possible to decrease the amount of electric lighting needed, whereas the HVAC system wants to reject as much daylight as possible to decrease its cooling load. Uh, instead of allowing two systems to compete against each other in this way, you can just have the integrated building control system look at building-wide energy savings instead of system-wide energy savings to inform each system how to best behave. Uh, however, there's a second issue, which is if you block out all the daylight during occupancy, then, well, occupants uh, not going to be able to see the outside world, uh, at least not as well, uh, which it's, it's definitely important for um, occupants to be able to see the outside world. Uh, what my supervisor told me is if it wasn't important, then we wouldn't have windows in the first place. So uh, that means that there has to be a decision at some point where should the algorithm prioritize energy savings or occupant comfort? As you can maybe guess, we chose uh, occupant comfort over energy savings, but that doesn't mean that everyone has to choose that. Uh, that doesn't mean that everyone has to choose that uh, option. And it could even be made on a per room basis. So one room could be if someone is, you know, not so worried about being able to see outside, they can have a different decision than someone who prefers to have that natural daylight. Uh, that's the flexibility that the integrated building control system provides in situations such as this. Uh, there's just one more thing to talk about the shading algorithm, which is uh, it can also improve occupant comfort if you include a daylight sensor. So uh, this can be used for glare protection. Um, while occupants like being able to see outside, if there's too much light coming in, then it can be uncomfortable for uh, occupants' visual comfort. Um, so the a luminance sensor can be used to infer when the space is over illuminated and the shades can be drawn at this point uh, 
to protect against glare and overillumination. The last algorithm that uh, I want to go over is the lighting algorithm. Typically, the lighting controls uh, are, I'm sorry, typically the lighting algorithm is handled solely by the lighting system. Uh, but the system integrator does have the ability to directly control the lighting algorithm. Uh, we are the Lighting Technology Center, so we took this opportunity to implement a dual loop control strategy that utilizes an automatic calibration feature. It kind of has to happen given that uh, that's what we do all day long. Uh, the dual loop strategy uses two photosensors, one that measures light levels in the space and one that measures daylight levels. With this information, the lighting in the space can be more accurately managed, which can save energy in some cases and improve visual comfort in others. One more thing that I want to talk about, it's not necessarily an algorithm, but it's very important, is uh, user interfaces. So with so many integrated systems, it's possible to have several interfaces, one for your windows, one for your lights, one for your shades, one for your HVAC, and that could be cumbersome. In the other's respect, maybe you have a lighting, I'm sorry, maybe you have a system that doesn't come with a, natu a native controller um, or user interface. So you can end up in a situation where you want one user interface to control multiple systems. And this is possible. We ended up having to do something similar where we used one eight button wall switch to control the lights, the shades, and the windows. What's great about this is that it means by integrating systems together, again, you can reduce on installation costs in some situations by reducing the need to purchase uh, multiple devices. Additionally, the user interface can be set up to provide additional occupant comfort. Uh, if you use a scene control approach, a single push of a button can make the entire system in a room uh, change to match the preferences of the occupant comfort. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting uh, to have you push a button, shades roll up and the window opens and lights start changing. It's, it's a lot going on and it's, it's really interesting to see. Um, it's, uh, by using this approach, you could simplify the interaction between the occupants and the uh, system. And uh, it gives them the ability to work in an environment that's personalized to their wants and needs. Uh, and also, there's nothing that says that the interface has to only be physical, such as the wall button that we have here. Integrated building control systems make it possible to create web-based interfaces. Uh, this can allow occupants to have more granular control. A wall switch has only so many buttons, but you can have easily continuous dimming. You can provide them the ability to open the windows more or less, bring the shades down. So whereas lighting may, I'm sorry, uh, whereas this wall switch maybe only provides binary control, uh, something like this can provide continuous control. Uh, and it doesn't stop there. You can also use smartphones. Um, there's a couple of interesting strategies using smartphones in building in uh, integrated building control systems. Um, so you could do the same thing as the web app on a mobile app. <clears throat> um, what's really interesting is that uh, when you take the smartphones, you then get a different uh, approach to solve the occupancy uh, sensing issue. Um, so occupancy sensors require constant re-triggering, and you know if that uh, ends up being annoying to you know anybody. I, I know that uh, I was in the office recently, and the sensitivity just isn't quite right, and so I constantly have to wave my arms at it to get it to re-trigger. If you have a smartphone, though, it can wirelessly communicate with the system integrator and just provide occupancy data that way. So using something along the lines of location services. That data can be tied to a profile. So if someone then moves into a new office or is working in a different room uh, on that specific day, instead of needing to reprogram a wall switch to match their scene preference, you can just have the preferences carry over with their uh, profile. So again, uh, user interfaces have a bunch of different options to improve occupant comfort uh, and I guess more so occupant uh, acceptance. Uh, if you have a system that's difficult to use, then you know people are going to reject uh, using that system. So to wrap this presentation up, uh, we looked at some of the ways that integrated building control systems are able to save energy and how they're uh, customizable to almost every application. You have multiple commercially available products for just about any application that you are interested in. You have a programmable system integrator, so you can apply any control algorithm that you're interested in trying. 
Uh, additionally, integrated building control systems can save energy and improve occupant comfort. This is accomplished by sharing data between systems or maybe managing the performance of the systems to account for building-wide energy savings instead of system-wide energy savings. And there's also the uh, idea that you can save on hardware and installation costs by sharing sensors and control devices across systems instead of installing one for each of them. Uh, ultimately, integrated building control systems have uh, tremendous amounts of opportunities. Uh, they can evolve, they can be upgraded as new products and strategies become available, uh, which this creates opportunities to devise new solutions to a variety of challenges. Um, so integrated building control systems, again, they're just a, a very exciting step in the process towards improving building-wide efficiency. Um, and uh, thank you all for listening.